I'm going to turn the uh, panel over to the moderator, Richard Kessler, who uh, not only is the chief operating officer of Benison, but he's an adjunct associate professor for us, one of our many great, outstanding professors that comes from the industry, and he's also one of the four chairs that put this together. Richard? Um, good morning. We, um, we just heard from a very esteemed equity panel that there's some optimism, there's future investment, and, and there are opportunities. Um, the question is, since equity makes up about $1 trillion of the real estate capital structure and $3 trillion comes from debt, has liquidity returned? What, what are the effects of the Eurozone crisis, the U.S. government disarray and, and, and budget issues, gov fiscal and financial regulations to the financial institutions, and the dichotomy that exists with very low interest rates and a seemingly abundance of capital. This morning, our distinguished panelists are going to discuss these and other issues. Um, so let's begin. My first sort of group of questions to the entire panel is, introduce yourself and your organization. How much capital do you have available for originating new debt in 2012? How much did you originate in 2011? And what are your favorite property sectors, um, loan to values, pricing terms, and sizing metrics? Starting with Mark. And, and please, everybody, try to use the mics. Okay. Um, we have two entities, uh, a private equity entity, Loan Corp, a billion and a half of capital, and Jeffrey's Loan Corp, a uh, billion and a half of capital, so total three billion. Uh, we, uh, you know, in terms of cost of capital, I have to check daily, but uh, cost of capital is somewhere around five and a half to six and a quarter fixed rate, and floating rate is probably you know, 600 off um, plus, maybe 550 off plus, uh, as well as we're active in the mezzanine space, and that probably starts at a nine and goes to the, to the mid-teens. Um, property types, uh, pretty much all property types, uh, you know, what, what we're comfortable with is probably more retail, office, industrial, uh, like everybody else, some hotel, um, but, uh, you know, for the buy and hold uh, portfolio, hotel would have to be uh, major CBD, something that we get very comfortable with, less kind of just debt coverage ratio, but more, more basis of, of the asset. Um, and did I, did I get it all right? Oh, origination. Um, this year, we're probably going to do a billion dollars in origination. We're at eight something and, and going and started in, in March. Um, and, uh, you know, so this year was our initial year on the origination. Um, we've done about 40 uh, transactions on the private equity side. Uh, that's a passive uh, buy and hold portfolio. Any other? Hi, I'm Greta Guggenheim, and I'm with Ladder Capital. We're a specialty finance company that was formed just to lend to commer against commercial real estate. And we've originated between fixed and floating rate loans about $2 billion this year and hope to double that next year. Uh, we, lend on, uh, we, we are a 5-, 7-, and 10-year fixed rate lender with execution in the conduit. And interest rates in that, for that product now are in the you know, mid-fives and up. Uh, and we're also a balance sheet lender for bridge and interim loans. And interest rates... Uh, go from six and up, pretty similar to, to Loan Corp, but a lot of our loans in that segment are a little trickier, so the rates are probably more, you know, eight percent-ish. Uh, we do all property types nationally. We have offices in uh, New York, Dallas, and uh, just opening one in Los Angeles. I'm Mike Higgins. I run the Real Estate Finance Group for Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. Uh, you know, we're uh, based out of Toronto, but we've been in the U.S lending on real estate for about 100 years. Uh, I've been there for 15 of them. <laughs> uh, we are basically a, a large bank that have a, an appetite for 
commercial real estate lending for our balance sheet and for CMBS. Uh, I would say in 2011, we're going to close about 5 billion in transactions with a large appetite of holding the majority of that, at least half of the floating rate stuff that we originate is for our balance sheet. We like the bank market to syndicate loans, and I would say our favorite loan uh, size now is 50 to 300 million of, of a loan size, and we'll keep a sizable chunk of that and then syndicate the balance. Uh, also very active uh, in the CMBS market, not recently because it's down, but very interested in that business, uh, did a lot of it in the past, and are geared up to you know, be very active in that uh, when we expect it to come back in 2012. But pricing, we're uh, more interested in the higher quality transactions. We typically will do non-recourse loans for our balance sheet, you know, two to five years. And they range from 50 to 70 percent loan to value. They can be non-stabilized, a lot of stabilized properties. Because the banks I find today are able to offer, at least we are, more flexibility in prepayment, et cetera, uh, than, than some of our competitors. So we are you know, very interested in the, in the market, uh, viewing it positively, think it's a good time. Uh, like We have increased our exposure. We're very active in the past, but our view today is we want to be a lot more involved in the larger uh, deals in the U.S., so uh, very active. I'm Robert Merck. I run the real estate department at MetLife. We're a uh, portfolio lender, which means that we, all the loans that we originate, we hold on our uh, balance sheet through maturity. We have a uh, $40 billion commercial mortgage portfolio and about a $10 billion um, real estate equity portfolio. And we've had a very uh, strong year so far this year in terms of new production. Through the uh, end of Q3, we had done eight and a half billion, and um, we've been active. I'll continue to be active in Q4, and uh, we think uh, next year will also continue to be a good year for us. We like the uh, strong relative value that uh, that we see in the marketplace right now for commercial mortgages and in uh, um, terms of uh, <clears throat> types of properties, really all commercial property types, office, industrial, retail, specifically focused on the uh, dominant regional malls, multifamily, and hotels um, or destination, very high quality hotels. And um, pricing wise, Spreads have kind of fluctuated during the year, but they've remained over 200 basis points typically. And uh, we have appetite ranging anywhere from short-term floaters, three-year floaters, all the way up to 30-year uh, fixed. But the majority of what we do is seven to 10-year fixed. I'm uh, Jonathan Pollock. I run the commercial real estate finance group at Deutsche. Uh, which means I have the honor and privilege of being a longtime colleague of Rob Blumenthal. Um, I, uh, we run um, uh, two um, uh, businesses within our uh, portfolio. So we do uh, CMBS lending, um, and we've done close to six billion dollars of that this year. Um, and uh, and that's typically five or ten year, mostly ten year fixed rate stuff. Um, and you know, um, notwithstanding what people have said about volumes in CMBS, we definitely have seen over the last six to eight weeks of uh, pickup in, in volume in our pipeline. Uh, and the other thing we do is um, high yield and distressed financing. So uh, we buy non-performing loans from other financial institutions and we also uh, finance uh, real estate operators through uh, distress rehabilitation situations. Uh, we've probably done about three billion of that uh, this year, um, although those loans tend to pay off quickly, so um, portfolio is nowhere near that size. Uh, but we have a very healthy appetite for both, and um, like, like the rest of the panelists here, looking forward to a very productive 2012. I'm Dave Tordock. I run the real estate lending business for Prudential. Um, our business has a life company portfolio component pretty similar to uh, Robert's at Met. Uh, we also are a Fannie Mae Dust lender, a Freddie Mac Program Plus lender, an FHA lender, 
and we have a CNBS lending platform and a venture with Perilla Weinberg. Uh, this year, uh, we'll probably end up somewhere around $9 billion in lending. Next year, I uh, hope to do more, but we'll see how the, how the market develops. Uh, let, most of what we do, almost all of what we do, is, uh, is five to ten year fixed rate debt. Uh, you know, I'll put leverage in sort of a debt yield context. Uh, you know, other than multifamily, it's sort of in the 10 to 12 debt yield range. In the portfolio, it's, you know, sort of the gateway markets, uh, institutional quality assets, and the CMBS uh, book will go into more secondary markets. Uh, and in the multifamily space, uh, debt yields are, are lower, leverage is higher, you know, 9% kind of, some, some less, some higher depending on the market. Uh, pricing is, uh, you know, for, for, for on book and for agency pricing, tenure is, you know, I'd put it somewhere in the 45 to 5% range. Uh, and in the CMBS book, it's wider. It's probably 100 to 150 basis points wider. Sounds like a good time to be a lender. We heard earlier that equity is looking for less leverage. Um, spreads seem to be wide, and their cost of capital seems to be low. So it's a good time to be a lender. But um, with, with what is happening in the CMBS market? I mean, that was a big component to the real estate capital markets. Um, up, in, up until uh, 2000 and end of 2007, 2008, and then everyone expected that th this year we were going to see about $50 billion in new originations in CMBS, and it was CMBS 2 was back, was back, and then we had the hiccup over the summer. So, you know, is CMBS going to coming back? It, how much is it going to fill of this gap? It seems that it was a very important component, and um, are we going to be able to sort of deal with the the $1.4 trillion of debt that's maturing in the next uh, several years without a strong CMBS um, origination vehicle? Yeah, I'll jump in on this one. I think, look, I, I, I think CMBS has actually had a very uh, productive year. I think the volume uh, sort of underperformance is more a reflection of what's happened in the broader capital markets than it is anything to do with CMBS, notwithstanding some of the coincidental timing of, you know, news events this summer, like the, uh, the S&P issue with, uh, with that one CMBS deal. But um, I, I think it, broader capital markets activity has, like, ceased since, you know, August and only recently have has leveraged finance pipeline picked up again. Um, corporates have had on and off opportunities to issue bonds. So CMBS is no different from the rest of the capital markets in that respect, and I think that's more the, the, the driver of the volume uh, being lower. Um, and I think among the, the many um, steps forward that CMBS took this year, uh, you know, issuing floating rate bonds for the first time in four years, et cetera, uh, was uh, the, um, the beginning uh, of the issuance of public securities. Um, I mean, it has dramatically changed liquidity in the AAA space, which is where the bulk of the volume comes from. Uh, I can tell you, you know, we were in the market with five deals between June and September. And it was night and day. I mean, the first couple deals we did were private, and it was, you know, we were clawing tooth and nail to try to, try to fill up our AAA book. Uh, and, you know, in August, we sold uh, a deal the week that the Dow was up and down 400 points every day. It was the most volatile week in the history of the equity markets. And it was the easiest AAA deal we sold because it was public. So I think that's a huge positive for uh, the potential investor volume in CMBS in the future. Um, and I think uh, I'll add one more thing, and then I'm sorry to hog the mic from, uh, from Greta and Mark. But... Um, I think there was a, a period of time earlier this year where uh, lenders felt very flush. They felt like the opportunity was going to last forever, and underwriting standards came under some pressure, and that's eased dramatically, which I think is also very healthy for, for our market. I'd like to weigh in on this one, too. I think one of the – CBS market had a very active first half of the year. It is slowed the second half of the year, and, and one of the reasons it's slowed is because the cost of capital increased. Uh, along with a lot of other uh, fixed income sectors. But w one of the fundamental issues is when, when the market went to a market where there was public bond issuance at the AAA sector, it also went to a 30% 30, 30 subordination structure again. And that leaves from, call it from 30% up to uh, 5%, you know, where you've got, you've got these sort of credit bonds. Uh, those credit bonds in the last cycle are places where people got burned a lot with volatility. 
And, you know, they don't trade a lot, but just to give you some indicative pricing, the AAA part of those, the subordinate AAA part of those are around 300 over treasuries today. The double A's are around 390, the single A's are around 580, triple B minuses around 750. Now, those are not investment grade bond rates spreads. I mean, you can buy, if you go in the corporate world and you look at those credit rates, you'll get a lot tighter spreads. And so there's a fundamental question here as to whether people believe the credit rating or whether they want to take on the volatility of those bonds. And I think one of the issues that's going to have to develop is how are we going to get confidence in that part of the capital stack for CMBS? Yeah, I, I would add that I, I agree totally pricing is a big issue with CMBS. There hasn't been enough demand from the borrower side to take loans at the six or six plus percent. When you're an active lender, it's, it's kind of when you're on the other side of the table, you actually can't get enough quality product. <laughs> it's competitive. <laughs> so we're looking there all year. We're busy. We're going to production meetings, pushing originators, hiring originators to say, we want to get our volumes up. We've got an appetite because we think it's a great time to lend. So you've got banks for our balance sheet. Like we're seeing some great deals. But at pricing, that we're competing with the insurance companies. And we, we do both. We're, we're a balance sheet lender and a CMBS lender. And we find on the balance sheet side, we're able to, it's a problem. We're beating ourselves by far on the pricing for a balance sheet deal. Now, the only difference will be quality or size of deal. But what's surprising to me is, and I think it's because there's still a lot of financing available out there, that borrowers with a $20 million loan or a $30 million or $40 million loan don't like 6% anymore. They'll sit there, and I think part of it is uh, people are getting used to their existing lender rolling over. If you're in a CMBS, you get an extension. Everybody has the feeling that you can stay where you are. And you, I don't see the pressure to move everything, and that's going back to the one point one trillion or more that you mentioned is come and do, not all that's going to hit the market. Most of those borrowers are going to stick with the existing lenders and say, how about another LIBOR 200? Well, two and a quarter percent pricing. Where do you get that? So, you, and, and that's an over leveraged loan in most cases. So I think that has to, we're working through that deleveraging process from all the loans that was made in the past and you don't have the demand, in my mind. The, the borrowers, you know, to get the pricing to work for CMBS, because I, I think CMBS will be back, but you got to fill up all the other appetites, the insurance companies, the banks, balance sheet, the active lenders. And there's a lot of lenders gone from the market, but I can tell you, for good quality deals, there's still competition on the lending side. Anybody who has a maturing loan with Michael, just remember, he just offered to re renew your loan at 200 over LIBOR. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I said I get that request. I don't do it. <laughs> but I, to address the demand side, uh, this year there's 36 billion of CMBS loans maturing. And if they were, if it qualified for a CMBS before, it probably, and not qualified for an insurance company, it probably doesn't qualify for an insurance company today. Next year, it's 46 billion maturing, and by 2015, it's over 100 billion. And I, you know, it, thank God the insurance companies don't do 65 plus leverage, or uh, in, in some cases. So all of these loans are at approximately, you know, 70, 75 percent leverage today, and that is a conduit product. Uh, also, what's happened in 2011 is the MES market has come back very strongly to gap the difference between the balance on the maturing loans and, and uh, what conduit and other types of lenders will do today. It's very strong. In fact, it feels like it's one of the most liquid parts of the, the capital stack today is to, is to gap that, that equity shortfall. So I feel like the, the, the conduit market is here to stay. I think we've addressed the, the demand for CMBS side, as Jonathan mentioned, by going back to the public model that was so successful before uh, 2007. And, uh, and I think the product will be there as well. I'll mention uh, just a couple things. 
The life companies have been very active the last couple of years, as everybody knows. Um, back in the, uh, in the peak, I think in 2006 or 7, they did about $40 billion, uh, in total. And that's probably the number that will be done this year, if not a little bit more. And we see that continuing. Um, but in terms of the $1.3 trillion coming up, um, I think, you know, there has to be the ongoing deleveraging process. There's going to have to be losses taken on deals that are over leveraged. Um, there will be new equity coming in to the deals that, uh, that, that you know, fit new equity being invested. And then there'll be the new, you know, new debt sized at what loans are sized at now, which is 65% or less. And for the very high quality in the top markets, it'll probably be the life companies. That's really where our um, volume is coming from now. And um, the CMBS market, with the pricing and with the constraints that they have, and and with the constra further constraints that they will have is once Dodd-Frank gets settled, um, there's going to be a market. I don't think it will be as big as it was. Maybe it'll be 50, 75 billion, but it'll continue to probably be focused more on the secondary markets or the properties that don't quite fit the insurance company model, maybe the smaller, smaller properties. But I think there's a real need for that, and uh, it will help create a much more functioning market. Mark, you can have a conversation about sure. CMBS without your commentary. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I agree that the deleveraging process is still going on, and that takes time because as real estate people in this room, we all know that where the banks had their marks, it was much worse. And I think we all knew it was going to take a number of years. Um, so I think, as Robert said, that process is happening. Um, it, uh, you know, what's happened is the special servicers don't want to push stuff out because their attachment point was getting lowered because the losses were too great when they were going to lose servicing. So it's just greed. They were going to lose money. Uh, they're going to lose that, the valuable servicing contract by, by forcing people out. It was better to extend. Um, the banks had $1.7 trillion. It's now $1.3 trillion. And most of that was write downs. It wasn't pushing people out. So the banks and specials haven't pushed people out. They will at some time. They will when it works for them. And I think that property values coming up has helped. A lot of the stuff, you know, I agree with people that's come out has not been the highest of quality. Um, it's been tough. There's been a lot of competition. Uh, but when, when it does come out, there's going to be a lot of it. Uh, and I don't know if it's the first six months of 2012, but it's going to happen. The other thing that's going to happen, too, is that investors will come back in for single A's and triple B's. Whether they should or not, you know, that time will tell, but they will because people are reaching for yield. There's a ton of money out there sitting on the sidelines. So it's, it's, it's going to happen. I think one of the things that, so I feel confident that's going to happen. One of the things that we worry about is, you know, the liquidity in Europe or the solvency of Europe and the derivative market and what that does in terms of capital costs, because AAA is still 70 or 80 percent. Hopefully we push it back up to 80. I think Jonathan did a great thing for the whole world when he did his deals at 70 percent because there was no market and it was a very smart thing to do. Um, but we'd like to see that go back up again in some way because uh, it increases uh, leverage and decreases capital costs. But, you know, one of the things that we worry about is just uh, CMBX and derivatives and, you know, the, that people, a lot of hedge funds, use that product as, as uh, hedging. Um, and they're not even commercial real estate people. And those, when those spreads go out, CMBS goes out. And it's... it's a very, we're a small market in, in, you know, if you look at the, all of fixed income, um, we're just a teeny market and we get pushed around um, in that market. And that's kind of the challenge that I, I, I believe in the market, but, I, you know, the funding costs moving around has, has been a challenge in terms of hedging um, and, uh, and, and cost of capital. Looking at it from a di just a slightly different perspective, if you're a borrower, all the borrowers who have, who have participated in the CMBS or conduit lending over the last few years who have had any type of issue have multiple complaints about trying to deal with the special services and work these things out. 
I mean, I, I, I was with a group of people on Monday night, and if you asked this whole group whether they would ever do a CMBS or conduit loan again, the answer was unequivocally no. They'd even pay higher interest rates other than to have to deal with, with that whole environment again. And so how is that going to impact, and, and what, what sort of changes does anyone see that's going to sort of help that special service of borrower relationship to, to um, enha enhance the experience to the borrower? I see Robert is smiling. <laughs> well, I, I, I don't really know what, what changes will be made to enhance that experience, but I was smiling because um, back in uh, 2005 and six and seven, when we were competing heavily with the securitization uh, market and the securitized lenders, uh, we used to use that as our, one of our marketing slogans that if you have an issue or if you need to talk to your lender you can pick up the phone and you'll probably you'll be able to talk to the same person that did the loan with you and uh, you don't know how many times over the last three or four years that we've had people come back to us and say uh, that maybe had gone with the securitized lenders had some issues they have come back and said boy I wish we'd have listened to you so it's it was an issue I, I'd be interested in, in what the guys think about, you know, how it will be going forward to, so that that, that issue w wouldn't be there. Yeah, I, I would say in the past, what happened in 06, 07, CMBS got so competitive and borrowers got greedy to take the 50 basis points less, they forgot all the other problems that's involved with dealing with third party services and trustees and all, the, you know, and, uh, that they're part of a public issue or a bond deal. Uh, it's, it's probably one of the, the big issues I think facing CNBS going forward is, uh, and, and it'll, I think it'll evolve. You know, the, the preference is if you have a high quality property and you can get pricing the same from an insurance company or a bank, you'll go with the bank, the portfolio lender that can give you a good service, it makes good sense. Um, CMBS can compete, I think, for lower quality properties or smaller properties. You know, they can be in good markets, but they're not going to be in the primary markets that big balance sheet lenders are looking for, insurance companies or banks. And that's just going to be a fact of life. And then on the other side, you've got rating agencies and investors saying, we only want quality. Well, guess what? That's all the insurance companies, and they're out there. They're, they know how to originate the best loans or the banks do. So you're going to have to deal with either high quality CMBS loans and pay up for them. And you'll always have this, I think, problem with the servicing. And it has to be built into the documents. I think it'll become, you have to build it into the documents on how you deal with the various issues. Yeah, th there's no doubt that if a borrower has a choice of doing a loan with an insurance company at a lower rate and dealing directly with them, they will um, in certain times, but in, there are some markets where, uh, like in 06 and 07, which isn't necessarily representative of the future CMBS market, we all hope, but uh, a lot of good quality properties in major uh, metropolitan areas were done in the CMBS because the CMBS market could provide more leverage. And that is still, um, it, while the leverage has dialed back in CMBS in 2.0, there, it, the leverage is still slightly higher. It's, it's, um, if the average metrics uh, for CMBS for 2011 is uh, a 11.6 percent debt yield and a 1.72 coverage for 2011. So that's not, it's not. Underwriting standards aren't bad. They're still very strong. It's just um, we're not getting. Uh, the, the same quality borrowers and a combination borrower and location as the insurance companies. But there are great properties in major markets. I know uh, Mark closed one of the best properties in the country in, in D.C. this year. And the reason it didn't go to an insurance company is because the conduit market will allow mezzanine debt behind the first mortgages, whereas a lot of the insurance companies tend to steer away from that. I, I know they do allow an exception. But you can still have great bars, great assets, and great leverage on that mortgage going into the CMBS trust. But because the borrower wanted mezzanine, it's not going to an insurance company. We closed it too, we closed it too tight, and we're going to lose money. But thank yeah, you. that was the market. <laughs> David. You know, one, one other point I just make on that 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 was real and is real today 
is that banks and insurance companies are great, but after a while, there's going to be concentration issues. You can only do so much with one client. So that's where I think CMBS does add a lot of value, is that it, you know, any borrower, they should not be doing everything with the one lender, and CMBS is a place where you can borrow a lot of money, and it doesn't necessarily have to clog up your borrowing capacity at the banks or insurance companies. So that's real. So, you know, and the market is real for CMBS. It'll come back, but uh, it's, going to take, it's going to take a while. David? I, I think if you, if you think about all the things we've been talking about in the CMBS market, one of the questions you have to ask yourself, is there a need for a different business model here? And, you know, the CMBS, let's take the issues here. You've got special servicing issues where borrowers can't get an answer. Uh, we have credit bonds that I think are, you know, priced pretty wide, which indicates, in my mind, a question on, you know, how investors feel about that part of the capital stack. Uh, you know, it's a high cost of capital right now. We also have regulatory uh, rules coming down that might change the way that uh, that, that market works. And, it, you know, is there an opportunity? It's, and you think about what happened with the REITs in the 1990s, where essentially you had to have a new model in order to, in order to reinvigorate the REIT market. I mean, maybe we need a new model to reinvigorate the CMBS market, a model where, you know, the, 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 the lenders hold risk, okay? A model where, instead of a trading model, where they're aligned with the investors over the long run. You know, a model where that maybe there's an operating advisor that oversees the special servicer, but the lender keeps, you know, the, the guy holding the risk is the lender and keeps the special servicing. So you can go talk to the same, to the same guy. I mean, you know, it, it, I, I guess one of my thoughts is maybe there's a different model that needs to develop rather than the typical trading model. And, you know, we got to recognize we're a close cousin to the residential market, which drove this economy into the ground. So we, I think we gotta, we got to react to that. I, a couple things to say to that. First of all, I think, you know, we're talking about how borrowers react to special servicers. You know, if you are talking to your special servicer, it's because you have a problem with your loan. I think if you polled every borrower that defaulted on a loan with a bank, probably not terribly thrilled with the way that process went either. And that's not necessarily in defense of the special servicers, but that's reality. I think it's a pretty myopic view of the market. Uh, I, look, I, and I think, secondly, when you talk about skin in the game, it's a, obviously a, a very polarizing subject, but you think about the way this market functions, right? It's unique among, and, and if you look at the resi market, the resi market had, had a problem because it didn't have this, right? Our market, we sell, you know, for me to sell uh, my, to bring my deal to the market, I have to have pre-sold the bottom 5% of my deal to a third party who has six weeks to have credit underwrite every loan that I have. And if I get back a loan or two, that's a pretty bad day for me with my boss. So it's a very, that's a very healthy interaction that was totally disintermediated by the CDO market in 05, 06, 07, because the guy who was buying that bottom 5% was just resecuritizing it himself for an arbitrage. Now that's back to being a, excuse me, a term hold, you know, credit investor market. I think that's a very, very healthy structure. I don't, you know, it doesn't address the first question that was asked, which is how, you know, how do borrowers get better service from special servicers? I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you, I don't think any of the balance sheet lenders were, were staffed up to deal with the flood of defaults that they had in the last three years either. You know, people did the best that they could. I think the market has, you know, for every borrower that's unhappy because he couldn't get an answer on a loan, there's a borrower who got a five-year extension at Lower Plus 200 from his CMBS lender, just like he got one from Higgins over here. So, <laughs> <laughs> just two large new development financings that took place in New, in New York. Does that mean that there's development and construction financing that's available and? Um, it, well, we have uh, we've done development financing in New York. Um, as a lender, I would say, and in this economy, you don't get a lot of requests for construction financing. Number one, uh, but when you do, the projects usually work very, very well, uh, especially in today's market. The only problem that I see with construction financing, and I've been in it a, a long time, I was actually trained as a construction lender at Chase in the 80s, it was never priced right. And there's a, there's a lot of risk to it. And the, the way we're approaching it now, and it's, it's a great market to be in it, is uh, you've got to pay for the unused. You don't get a free commitment to draw down your, as you build the project. So I think 
and uh, I'd love to see it happen, but it's hard to get all the banks. I think it's a product that, if it was priced right, it would help the market overall because it would control development as well going forward to make sure everything is, is in equilibrium. So we will do it. Uh, borrowers are not used to paying what pricing should be because, you know, when you can make a good loan and get your money funded and get paid on it versus make a development loan that has all great metrics, but you don't have any, any of your loan funded. And funding, as everybody knows from the previous panel, and if you're, if you're alive, funding is a real issue since in the U.S. since 2008, and now we're seeing Europe, that every bank in the world is figuring out funding is really important. But, but, but Michael, you know, in, in New York, you know, multifamily, you know, 80, 20 projects and so forth seem to be okay, and, and there seems to be money available. But if you're doing something that's outside the multifamily and outside of sort of the major markets on the coast, is there, is there financing available for construction? Well, yeah, that's, that's what I was talking about. There is, there is construction financing available. You got to have pre-leasing. Uh, we actually did a hotel financing in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, that closed last year, um, or closed actually this, this year in 2011. Again, it's very few and far between. You have to have a top quality client, top quality project. Uh, but there is, there, there is financing available for products outside of the 8020. You got to have pre leasing, you got to pay the price. You know, for a bank like us, you just have to pay the pricing because. There is other opportunities that you can make funded loans. But I, would, I, would say, I would say, so I, the question I'd ask back is, is there really a relevant construction product to do outside of the markets you're asking about? I mean, most real estate in the non-coastal major city markets trades below replacement value. So I'm not sure there's necessarily demand for construction financing. You know, I don't think I, so. I think that's the right answer. I mean, you're not answer. getting a lot of demand, but you can get the people will lend. Again, it's just a pricing issue in the, in the right markets. I have, a, I have a, many more questions, but I'd like to make sure that we have time for the audience to ask their questions. And so I understand that there are two mics um, here and here. So if anyone has a question. I, I don't. Then, I, then I'll keep going. Okay, I'm sorry. There's a mic right there for you. Yesterday, an article came out in Wall Street Journal that Wells Fargo has uh, restructured their uh, uh, restructured their, uh, their their CMBS structure from six to from six to six point five to five to six percent. Um, how do you think that's going to affect the market? And do you think that's d just done to uh, reflect, po hopefully, posi hopefully uh, reflect a positive gain in Q1 and Q2? Were you referring to an interest rate reduction or a volume projection? Interest rate. Interest rate. I, 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 in general, CMBS. I don't know if that was their, that that was specifically CMBS, um, but the spreads have come in significantly since June and July. Um, so where we were quoting, and, and, and I think some of my colleagues here were quoting in the sixes, uh, call it 60 days ago, most things now are in the mid to high fives. So I think that's industry wide. The, the AAA super senior spreads have come in quite a bit uh, in, the last, in the last few weeks. And so I think that's a driving, people price CMBS loans based upon where they can sell the bonds. And uh, with the bond pricing in, the, the origination market pricing is coming. Anyone else? Okay. Well, I, have, I have some questions um, from my students that I'm going to ask. Um, one of them being, um, what impact is the Eurozone crisis going to have in, um, on lending in 2012 in the real estate markets? Well, um, I'll jump in on that. I mean, I think uh, the Eurozone the crisis in, in Europe is one of the things that is troubling to the economy in the U.S. It's also putting pressure on the banks, not only in Europe, but which are under extreme pressure, but in the U.S. also. So it may be that it, it 
creates more issues in terms of lending from the banks, but from uh, from a insurance company standpoint, uh, it has been a positive. We've uh, we've had an office in the UK for uh, for many years and uh, have historically had a very hard time competing in the first mortgage market because the uh, European banks really dominated that market and uh, starting the end of last year there's been a real we've seen a real opportunity over there and so we've been very active in uh, in London specifically just doing first mortgage loans on very high quality properties very similar to what you see here in the U what we do in the US and so uh, from the standpoint of uh, the insurance company lenders, it's creating some good opportunities to diversify outside the U.S. Yeah. I would say um, a couple couple factors I see. One, I think base rates in the U.S. will stay extremely low here for a while because of the volatility. There's been one of the things that's driven Treasury yields so low has been a, a, a flight to quality that I think will persist. I mean our our rates desk, I don't know if I believe this, but our rates desk is calling for a 1.5% tenure uh, sometime in the first quarter next year. Um, two, um, you know, there's the sort of boogeyman factor of everything happening in Europe. But the one concrete thing that we've seen, um, which I think is both a risk and, 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 an, and an opportunity, is there's almost, to, to your point, there's almost no lending by European financial institutions in Europe right now. And if anything, yeah, they're under this massive pressure to delever themselves. So there's very little lending activity in Europe, which the risk factor is obviously broader economic contagion from that cessation of economic activity. On the other hand, the one thing that they're going to cut before they cut their home countries is their non-core assets outside of their home country. So I think we'll see a lot of, one, lending gaps here in the States where European banks were lending. Not, you know, I guess we're one of those, so I don't know whether that includes us or not. But, um, but two, I think you'll see, you know, f uh, for those in the audience interested in the distressed market, I think you'll see more European banks selling distressed, you know, U.S. real estate loans uh, or legacy loan portfolios in the States just as, as one of the uh, tools they have to trim their balance sheets. You know, I, I've been a life company lender and before this ran a, a major top five banks lending and now this side and, you know, the, the, the issue with, first of all, the life companies fund themselves differently. So in some ways they're enjoying watching us uh, have this volatility in the secure, you know, the AAA market because uh, they're partially funded that way. but. They just have a lot more stability in terms of how they fund themselves. And if, you know, we watch Europe, if, if Europe melts down, we may go back to what we saw uh, in 2008. And so we're terrified um, about what happens in Europe because if you fund yourselves um, off of securities and you, you're going to see just a massive amount of deleveraging um, and paper gets put to the market very quickly. Um, and you know, best bid, and you know, there's if there's times when there's just not enough to absorb uh, the amount of paper getting getting sold. So um, we're very worried about Europe, um, and uh, you know that there that that is um, you know that it definitely affects CMBS, um, and you know so so that's the thing that we're watching, um, and I think the life companies are, you know. This last time, I mean, they came in and they widened out and they took <laughs> took the stuff off the market and, and made a lot of money. Um, so uh, you know, it's just the, each each different participant, how you fund yourself and who you are, you have uh, advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, I, two fi I, two I final questions. Ju just on that, there's definitely there's going to be less lending. All the foreign banks, they will have to pull back outside their their home country, and that means higher pricing for everything. And more opportunity for you. Two final questions, just going down, starting with David. Okay, where do you think interest rates are going, to, the 10 years going to be in 2012? And then in keeping with the theme that there are a lot of students um, in the audience, what advice do you have for them as far as careers in real estate? Did you say the 10 year? The 10 year for 2012. Uh, I think it's gonna be a little bit higher, I'd, I'd guess, but not a lot, I'd say two and a half percent. Um, Sort of would be my guess. I'm I'm thinking we're still going to have a recovery and and things are going to get a little bit better. Uh, for students, I'd say you know uh, 
One of the great things that you can, you can do in this kind of environment is see um, the results of things that didn't work. And yeah, it's an interesting time, I think, to get into the business. Uh, we, the last panel and this panel, I think, both said there's going to be this deleveraging, this distress is going to go on for a while. I think it's an interesting thing to get some experience in earlier in your, early in your career because these cycles don't happen very often. And uh, getting some exposure to what happens when things go wrong is, is something that only comes along a couple times a career. Uh, well, I already said with the, the Deutsche Bank call is one and a half, so far be it for me to contradict the experts on the Deutsche Bank rate desk. Um, although I do agree that uh, I think there's, there is, uh, there is a possibility to the upside on, on the U.S. economy, especially if you think about, I mean, I think, you know, to what Mark was saying about you know, forced deleveraging the states. I mean, this, the financial system hasn't been this delevered in a very long time in the states. So I think there's, you, know, you, you couple that, very healthy corporate balance sheets, with a very low interest rate environment because of the flight to quality of this country, you could actually see, and in, in our, econom our chief economist is, is calling for this, a very big year in the U.S. next year. I, you know, I don't know. I guess there's the risk of the Europe overhang. Um, following on, on the point about um, sort of learning lessons from the previous cycle, I think one of the things that uh, a lot of people did in the previous cycle is they saw a tremendous amount of very rapid wealth creation um, among the more senior members, people who'd been in the industry for a while. Uh, investment banking and hedge funds, private equity funds. Um, and so people followed um, sort of rapid fire career decisions to try to follow that get rich quick path. And I think, um, you know, following a steady career path uh, is, um, you know, is something very important, I think, to learn out of the last cycle because a lot of, a lot of those people sort of fell out of, the, uh, fell out of the job market in our industry and have had trouble finding their way back in. Um, Whereas people who sort of stuck with the, their institution, stayed the course on whatever they were doing in particular, have actually found this to be an opportunity to sort of move up a notch in their careers. I've got to ask everyone just to be a little bit briefer because they told me I'm out of time and you are between them and their donuts and coffee. So, R Robert, come on. thank you. Okay. Well, my opinion, not, and I won't speak for MetLife, is that rates will remain low during 2012. I would say there are a couple things in terms of advice for students. They've already been said. One is to be flexible. Uh, that is, look at the opportunities that are available today and jump in there, which may be loan workouts, things like that. Use the chance you have in school with your colleagues to network and with your professors. And as was said, I think it's important to stay the course. The grass will always look greener on the other side when you're in a job, but I've found and, and through experience and through talking to a lot of people over the last 30 years, those that stay the course tend to be in better shape. Yeah, I, I would say rates will probably be higher, but for students definitely it's a good time for young people to get in at this stage. Uh, you know, you're, you're at the bottom, so Hopefully, it's all up from here and a great time to get a lot of good experience and, you know, hopefully have a long, a long career in 2012 is an election year. I don't see any major upward movement in rates. And for the students, just get a job, whether it's an unpaid internship for a little while, just get out there and find something. Um, it's really hard to get a job now, so just take what you can. I'd say rates higher and for the students. I, I agree with everyone. Just Get working. Don't worry about what you get paid. You know, when 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 your career gets there, you'll make make the money later. My first job was an unpaid internship. <laughs> Join me in thanking this great panel.